indoors. Walking through the streets with an explosive device in your hand. Not knowing exactly when it would go off. Was really quite excruciatingly scary. It sounded extremely loud and you imagine that everybody could hear it. I used to feel that this ticking was ticking at the same speed as my heart, which was racing. This was a leaflet bomb. The messages were aimed at Africans. They were pretty harmless. Our intention was never to hurt anybody with these things. It was about as powerful as a firecracker. The leaflets urged people to fight against the government. It was the only way we could spread our message. There was a great pride that we were doing something that was meaningful. We knew ultimately that we were going to continue until we got caught. And if we were to be caught, then we would be called terrorists. They came at two o'clock in the morning. I knew that it was curtains for us. It was a great defeat. We'd been defeated by the enemy and couldn't carry on with the struggle. Tim got 12 years and I got eight years. It was gut-wrenching to hear the length of time that we were given. That means your entire 30s kind of years where one starts families and they'll be locked away. But even before we were convicted, we had decided that we were going to escape. We had no idea how hard it would be. It was a maximum security prison. It had a lot of security measures to prevent prisoners getting out. There were numerous gates. Many metal grill doors. Solid metal doors. At night, there were dogs in the yard. Large Alsatians trained to attack if any person comes near them. It looked pretty terrifying. Everything was dark and everything was bleak. We just had to get out. From the very first day, we started to collect intelligence about possible escape routes. On the one side, the prison yard it was a six meter high iron fence and if you did get over you just landed back in prison property there were only 10 political prisoners in the prison at that time all of them said this is one of south africa's top high security prisons there's no way out of here There had to be some way. The first thing was really to get out of ourselves. 
When your mind is focused, everything counts. I looked at the lock. And I realized that to get out of here, I've got to make a key for this. It might sound absolutely extraordinary that I thought perhaps we could do it. I'm not a locksmith, but I had in earlier years opened locks and used to pick the back door with a piece of wire, and so I had a very, very good understanding of how locks worked. The first problem was deciding what does this key look like? What is the shape of this key? Then I came up with this idea. I got a piece of paper, and then using the knife that I had up there for spreading my bread, I just pressed that piece of paper inside the lock. That gave me the depth of the lock inside, which was the same measurement of the head of the key. So that was a start. After breakfast, we were required to work in a carpentry workshop. And I thought, I wonder if we could make a key out of wood. I knew that Tim was really good with his hands, but I doubt if it would work. I started to carve a few little pieces of wood, one for the shaft and one for the bit of the key. We had to make these parts under the noses of the guards. We just hoped that nobody would see us. And I actually made most of that key in that workshop during that first week. But now I needed to smuggle it up into my cell. I just took the chance and carried the parts of the keys and the tools that we needed a triangular fire and some glue and a thermos flask. As they fitted tightly around the container inside, they didn't rattle. It was dangerous. They did have regular inspections. My heart is racing. I thought, that's the end of it, right at the beginning. away with it. The first job was really to get that key just to fit in the keyhole. I put the key in and turned it. It didn't work. But wood is a very good medium because as you turn it, the metal leaves a mark on it. You could see where it was jamming. And I took the file that I'd brought you have the lock right in front of you, so you can keep testing it. Filing and filing and filing. Until it fits. Boom, this thing just slid open absolutely smoothly. I couldn't believe it. It's just that feeling, it's just like, wow. But that was just the beginning. If I thought it'd been easy to escape, I couldn't have been more wrong. On the outside of that door was a solid metal door. The problem here was that the keyhole was only on the outside. There was no way of reaching that from inside yourself. That was just absolutely impossible. In order to get to the lock on the second door, we had to do this from the corridor. And so this had to be done on the Friday when the section was being cleaned by 
for the prisoners. We had full support from the other prisoners, so everybody was aware of what we were planning. My job was to listen out for the approach of any warden coming up the stairs. I'd come along with a blank that I'd made with more or less the key shape, but unsure that it would work. Tried it out, I could see it was catching on the inside. I had my file there again. I was filing and filing. And it worked. The bolt popped out. So I'd actually made key number two. That was so easy, it was amazing. But when I came to turn it back in, it just wouldn't go in. It just continued to stick out. He's stuck. What? We had a complete disaster. How do we explain a door with a bolt sticking out through the water? My heart suddenly started pounding, and I got that sort of dizzy, empty feeling. They're coming, they're going to find this guy trying to unlock his door. I would get another 15 years just for that five minutes of joy. I could hear these guys getting closer and closer. We didn't know what to do. We just left it. And the warden found the bolt out. And that scared everyone. But then one of the warders started blaming another one for not knowing how to unlock the door. We had a very close shave. After the scare, when Tim was first working on the second lock, it was decided that it should only be done with the door closed. The problem was that although the cell had a small window, it was a long way from the keyhole. It was not possible to reach the lock. Your arms simply were not long enough. So we were kind of stumped, couldn't think of a way. Then one night, something clicked. In each cell, you were allowed to keep your broom for sweeping out in the morning. I thought, why can't I put the key on the end of this broom? I took a block of wood and inserted a key into the block. Then this block was fastened to the end of the broom. It was a very, very simple mechanism, a bit like a crank handle on the steam engine. I could guide the key into the keyhole and just simply crank it around. It just worked. And it worked as smoothly and as easily as door number one. I could have actually stepped right out Stephen. Stephen, it worked. Tim giving me the thumbs up and uh, just feeling thrilled. It was a huge, huge emotional occasion. And this was going to let us out of the cells into the corridor. We started to wonder how far we could go. Maybe we could get out of our section, into the prison yard, and then anything was possible. The next door, door three, was the door at the end of our section. And the only time that we had access was on Friday mornings when we were cleaning the section. It was a solid door. We had a peek through the keyhole to see if anybody was on the other side. There was no one there. First of all, I tested it with the keys that I had made. 
was a very dangerous activity. They take an escape attempt very seriously. There would have been another trial and another sentence. I couldn't believe it. It used exactly the same key as door one. This just for me just seemed crazy. That meant that we could get out of ourselves and out of our second. That was a major breakthrough. Our success with door number three opened up a whole new wave of thinking about the escape. But what I'm telling you here might sound absolutely incredible. We thought maybe the best way to get out of the prison was through the front door. Let's make a key for every keyhole. I thought it was a crazy idea. But we decided to go for it. But we didn't know how many doors were exactly where we were heading. To find out, I worked out a plan. I said to them, I needed to go to a dentist for some treatment. I could see the doors for myself. And I could do it uh, on the way out and on the way back. It was a huge shock. We had to open up ten doors. Ten doors? There's no way to get through the front door that required opening ten different doors. It altogether presented an insurmountable problem for us. We need some help. One of the other eight prisoners seemed to be different from the other one. From the time I was called, my objective was to escape. He approached us and said that he wanted in. Alex brought an extreme sense of discipline and bloody-mindedness. I considered that escaping was the duty of every one of us. He became our best friend because we were talking the kind of language that he wanted to hear. OK, so he's ourselves, OK? We had keys to our cells. That was doors one and two. Door three, the door to our section, we were able to get through that. Downstairs was door four, leading into the administrative section, and door five beyond that. Now, door six leads out of the administration area, but it's right by the main office. I knew this would be a difficult one to deal with. Then doors seven, eight, nine, then up some stairs, then door ten. The final door preventing us from reaching uh, freedom. My attitude was that of pushing ahead. My attitude was to solve the problems, to overcome everything that would stop us. Coming down the stairs, the very first door into the administrative section is what we call door four. Now we used to march past that door several times a day. Early in the morning, up for lunch, down from lunch, back up in the evening. They locked and unlocked this door right in front of my eyes, so I knew more or less the size of the key. I made a blank for it. One day, nobody was looking and there was no guard around. We went to test this key. If we were caught here, the whole plan would obviously be terminated. It was very, very scary. And it worked. So 
so that was the next one in our bag. I was so excited. I apparently had a grid on my face the whole time. We were very pleased, but there were still major obstacles ahead. For Tim and Alex to be able to get access to the doors in the administrative section, they had to get past the warder. From 4.30 in the evening, the single night warder on duty who was locked into the prison. The problem with door five and six was that it was right next to the night warder's office. And it seemed to be an insuperable problem. But there I remember the night warder, his name was Sergeant Vermeulen. He had a very fixed routine, and you could rely on it 100%. Every evening, he would play music over an intercom system into our cells. When he'd finished, he switched off the intercom system and went on his inspection of the prison. So there was a little uh, window of opportunity there. OK, um, here's the warder. Every night, he leaves on patrol, comes down the corridor, up the stairs to our cells. While he's doing that, we need to go downstairs. How can we get past him? We needed somewhere to hide. I have an idea. We knew that under the stairs there was a cupboard. We decided that this was a feasible place for two and possibly three of us to hide away while someone was going up the stairs. And if our timing was correct, we would be hiding in a place and he would be walking right past us. It was at least 15 minutes that he'd be out on this tour around the prison. So that was all the time we had to get all the way to doors five and six and test them and get back into the cupboard before he returned. On the actual day, we were extremely nervous. Step one was to create dummies in our beds. Step two was getting out of our cells and down to the ground floor before the record ended. I knew it would take a couple of minutes. This whole operation was contingent on Alex and myself going downstairs and hiding in the cupboard before the music stopped. This was very important because we didn't want to run down while he's coming up. There's nothing more scary than the thought of going down and actually crossing over this guy. Fear certainly was there. It was there constantly. But then you had to have sufficient reserves to be able to overcome your fear. It was like going out into a new universe where no one else had ever been and it was very, very scary. Every moment, every instant, there was always a danger of something going wrong. It was an eerie silence after the music stopped. And every sound was magnified hugely. We realized that there was one detail that we hadn't thought of. And that was how to hold the cupboard doors closed from the inside. Okay. There's nothing to really pull this door closed apart from the tiny little cupboard lock. 
that was one of the most frightening moment I have passed uh, while in prison, holding that lock with the end of my finger. We could hear him getting up from his chair, picking up the keys, opening his own door, walking down the corridor towards us. It was the most nerve-wracking experience of my entire life. If Emil had spotted us, the consequences would have been dramatic. It would have highly embarrassed them, and they would have thrown the book at us. I heard the opening of the door. My finger is trembling. And at that very moment, Alex's fingers must have been sweating so much. The door actually swung open. We just thought, that's the end, that's the end. Both of us were quaking and shivering. Yet the warder didn't hear it. He was in a complete trance. <laughs> and going up the stairs towards our section. That was a very, very intense moment. We knew we had about 15 minutes before Arthur Meehlin came down again. We had to move quickly. To our surprise, we found that Vermeulen had left uh, door four open. So that was one more hurdle that we didn't have to bother about. Door number five. I tried the key I had made for door one. And the very first time I tried it, it just worked. And there in front of us was door number six. We had no idea what key it used. This big, great, gray barrier, like a secret entrance to some hidden tomb. I stay behind to warn him if the water is coming. The guard familiar and went upstairs. heads were hidden from sight. By looking through the cell windows, he wasn't able to see that it was just a dummy. I took all the keys that I had and tried each one in door number six. I tried the number two key, but it jammed immediately and didn't turn properly. It took a long time. I was very worried. It was nerve-wracking, waiting for Tim and Alex to come back. I tried to imagine exactly what they were doing and where they were. Then suddenly Alex said, Time is up. We've got to come out. Give me a second. And to me, it felt like I'd only been there for a few seconds, but apparently I'd been there for 10 minutes. <laughs> Up. Alex started getting quite agitated because I just kept saying, wait, 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 I want to try one more thing. And Alex said, no, come, come, the time's up. Come, come back. Just give me a second. He's coming back. Give me a second. So I had to give up. The two of us had to go back to the cupboard. We could hear him coming down the stairs. Our knees were quaking. 
We could hear him going back into his office. He heaved a sigh of relief. The two of us crept back to our cells. We had a sense of defiance, but also a sense of defeat because we hadn't breached the number six barrier. We hadn't really succeeded. And that's very bad. But we were trying to fight against the, the idea that it was impossible to get through. Finally, we hit upon the scheme of making a shaftless key. The difference about this key was that it was made of wire, a multi-purpose kind of a key. Instead of a circular motion, you just push the bolt backwards. I thought that it would work just like the master lockpick. And we decided that we were going to try it out. We hoped it would get us through door six. But there were still four more doors beyond that. Now we needed more than the usual 15 minutes he spent on his inspection round. The attempts to do everything were going to take an awful long time. And my job was to delay the sergeant from moving him. We went down, following exactly the same procedure. unsure that the shaftless key would work. I just was praying. I put it in. You had to be very, very, very gentle. I hoped that Stephen would be able to delay for Mullen to give me enough time. What was the score of the game? I, I missed it. Sergeant Vermeulen, he loves talking about rugby. 21-14. And we were able to use this to our advantage. Thanks. I would take as much time as I possibly could. Do you get to go to the games often? More than you. <laughs> I was turning this thing and twiddling and fiddling and pulling and yanking. There's an absolutely exhilarating feeling. So now we win this small pocket between door six and door seven, a kind of no man's land. We had absolutely no idea of what went on there in the evening. The two of us were faced with door seven. I had a brain wave. Because it was a grill, I was able to unscrew the bolts. Hey, do, you, do you take your, your kids? Because they love it. They, oh, they just oh, love oh, the oh, crowds oh. and the... And I thought, let's destroy this lock inside. Then virtually stick your finger in or even a butter knife and the lock would open. I got it. Come on, come on. There were three more doors to go, but we were racing against the clock. You've got a, a, a daughter, yeah? Just, just the one? Yes. Door eight was already open. And, and then we were faced with door nine, which was just an ordinary wooden door. I tried one of the keys that we already had and it opened. Have a good night, sir. Thank you. So now we were facing the final door, door 10 the very door that we entered that prison through. The small wooden door that you would find on any normal suburban house. But we didn't dare to, to even try to open it. Our time was up. Vermeulen was surely on his way back down. We came out and hid again in the cupboard. We thought now the way was clear for the actual final escape. We just have to take our chances with door 10. Stephen would now join us. So we had to convince someone else to delay for Mullen. Dennis Goldberg, who is considered to be the leader of the prisoners. But 
our plan was that Dennis would try to delay him for as long as possible. Hello, boys. Hello. I committed myself to the escape. We found the answer in that we just used the trip switch of a very sensitive electrical system. If the lights went out, I could call him to come and switch the lights on. That was the plan. This was the big day. This was, this was it. We tried to suppress our own excitement and nervousness by just pretending. It was just a normal day. We got dressed in regular civilian clothing that had been left behind by some of the guards. It occurred to us, we are three high-profile political prisoners. They would have taken it very seriously. But we were prepared to take our chances. Alex came past my cell and sort of put his hand up, just a hand wave to say they're on their way. And then, quiet. I tripped the switch for the wrong part of the prison. And in such a way that it's really difficult to, to put it back again, so it would give us sufficient time. Lights went out, and of course you know that lights are very important for security. So being a dutiful prisoner, I called the night guard for Mirren. Sergeant for Mirren! To come and switch on our lights. Sergeant, the lights! Sergeant the three of us crammed into this little tiny cupboard, and it was a very tight fit. I was sure that we were going to be caught inside this little cupboard. Eventually, we hear Vermeulen walking slowly down in a very unhurried way, opening door four. And slowly moving up the stairs and into our section. Quick as a flash, we came out. And Vermeulen came. When he spoke to me about rugby, what was startling about it was a hollow feeling in my stomach. Am I going to keep him long enough? Didn't dare to look around to see whether we're being observed. We opened door five. My heart was pounding away like crazy. Opened door six. and immediately went to door seven and opened it. And we proceeded down through eight, which was open, opened nine. And there we were standing before our final door, number 10. I tried all the keys in my bag of tricks. None of the keys that we had worked. Here, this tenth door, this pathetic little house door, wouldn't open. It was an absolute nightmare. How'd your rugby team do this weekend? By this time, I really thought I was a master lockpick. I could open any door. And I tried my picks from this door, and again, it just wouldn't open. I was absolutely flabbergasted. Fabian walks down the passage, switch the lights on, didn't spot the dummies in the beds. 
then stomps back down the steps. Are their keys going to work? Are they going to be blocked in and not get out? I could do this. I tried and I tried and I tried and I could see that Alex and Stephen were getting very agitated. They catch us now. I know, just give me a minute. just said, we can't open this door, we have to go back. We've been beaten. We had to make a very serious decision at that point. We could hear Vermeulen going back into his office. This now meant that he was between us and ourselves. I turned around to, to my comrades and said to them, you have to use the chisel. No, I didn't like that idea at all because for me that was too crude. You're crazy? That was just not my style. We've got to get out of here without leaving a trace. No, no, I can do this. Alex and I were unanimous on this point. All right, just break it. We're not going back. We wanted to go for it. I'm sorry. Tim had no choice. Alex started to chip away the wood behind the thing and I couldn't bear it. Mullen was right there, just a few meters away. It made a huge, graunching kind of scraping noise. It was agonizing to watch it, and every second seemed like forever. The noise was terrible, and I thought, no, this is the end. Finally, the door yielded to our pressure. <laughs> you know, it was uh, a really wonderful feeling getting through number 10. <laughs> and I said, OK, Alex, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. And Alex yanked the door and pulled it wide open. I was walking on air. I was flying. We were still in considerable danger. We didn't really know what lay outside there. We held our heads low. There was a warder leading against a car, talking to another who was about to drive off. That was a heart-stopping moment. They didn't bat an eyelid, they just saw three civilians. At that moment, we knew that our disguise was working. No sirens were blaring, no one was running after us. Our emotions suddenly started to kick in. The smiles on our faces grew bigger and bigger and bigger. We seemed to be completely invisible. We've done it, we've done it, we've done it. We're out of here. 